Good evening and afternoon, everybody. I'm Dan Ramirez, uh, president of the American Society of Church History, and welcome to the 2021 meeting meetings of the American Society of Church History. For those of you hunkering down in the Midwest and Northeast, you should know that the weather in Seattle is 46 degrees with few showers and southerly winds at 11 miles per hour. There is a small craft advisory for anyone planning the Bay excursion during the meeting, so be careful. And if you're planning to, dr to drive up to Vancouver, forget about it. <laughs> I am greeting you from my sabbatical. I had hoped to greet you from the General Archive of the Indies in Sevilla, Spain, and not from the General Archive of Dr. Ramirez in Claremont. And I'll console myself later tonight by going over to Viva Madrid's patio in downtown Claremont for Spanish wine and tapas. And this all reminds me of the deep wisdom of the Scottish poet Robert Burns, who upon accidentally plowing over and destroying a field mouse's abode in 1785, observed in his poem to a mouse on cheering her up in her nest with the plow, November 1785, that small heap of leaves and stubble has cost you many a weary nibble. Now you are turned out for all your trouble without house or holding to endure the winter's sleety dribble and hoarfrost cold. But mouse, you are not alone. Improving foresight may be in vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men go off to rye and leave us nothing but grief and pain for a promised joy. John Steinbeck, of course, reminded us of that truth again in 1937. And so did COVID-19 in 2020. But here we are finally gathered virtually and in spirit. Welcome all. I am going to begin and give a brief rundown of uh, the past year uh, and pass it on afterwards to uh, past President Paul Lim and then uh, to Anthea Butler, uh, President-elect. And this will serve as our stand-in business meeting to keep you, uh, bring you all up to date on numbers, finances, et cetera. And then after that, we'll go to the meat of the meeting, and that is to celebrate our prize winners. This has been a challenging year for all of us, but thankfully we had a team come together consisting of the leadership and also our amazing staff, our council and our committees who have all worked tirelessly and effectively to meet the challenges that this past year and this year brought. Last year, when we were confronted with the clear impact of the pandemic in March, everybody moved quickly and effectively and nimbly uh, to make a series of decisions for the good of the society and its members. And the biggest decision, of course, was the cancellation of our in-person meeting scheduled for January 2021. That allowed us to avoid taking a major financial hit. And that nimbleness will continue to serve us. So in spite of having to cancel this year's in-person meeting, and in spite of the turbulence of 2020, our finances remain in good shape. Typically conference registrations pay for the conference, and so not having one represents a, a wash. But other sources of revenue remained high, including an unusually high number of members who gave general, general and charitable contributions to society. And for this, we we're extremely grateful. The prize endowment initially dipped with the market, but then recovered and, uh, and even more so by the end of the year, and it currently stands at a record high. And the very fact that we are celebrating the prizes speaks to the financial soundness of the society. Our membership numbers are also strong. We were concerned last year, of course, about the ramifications, but we're happy to report that the, the numbers uh, reflect uh, You're okay minimal, minimal uh, impact. Uh, we, without hosting an in-person conference, we have only 37 fewer members year to date, less than 5% than at this point last fiscal year. Membership revenue stands only about 2% behind where it was at this point last year, far ahead of where we thought it might be due to the pandemic. And if my custom is uh, indicative of others. We probably have folks paying tonight and tomorrow to uh, come to the conference. The percentage of graduate students with current membership remains steady at 20% of the total membership. And this, of course, augurs well for the long-term health and future of the society. 
And as you know, we have been very concerned about the mentoring practices in the Guild, and so the membership committee uh, continues to connect early career scholars with more senior scholars at our annual meetings, and this meeting is no exception. So these strong numbers show the resilience of our society, which is rooted in your commitment to it. We thank you for that commitment. We encourage you to continue to demonstrate that commitment by renewing membership, reading and writing for church history, participating in the events that are unfolding uh, throughout the year. So uh, unlike the field mouse, we are not shivering in the winter and things look bright uh, ahead for us. So I am now going to ask Paul Lim to speak uh, to uh, matters concerning the journal and then for Anthea Butler to speak uh, to this year and uh, next year's conference. And then uh, we'll ask Caleb Maskell to speak uh, briefly and introduce uh, Jesse Sponholtz and Andrea Sturk, who will then uh, announce the prize winners. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you, Dan. As the uh, past president or president emeritus, the term emeritus means out of merit, right? So <laughs> I have a relatively easy task, but I can just remember um, the last meeting in person um, that was really exciting. Uh, and it seems like just ages ago, right? And I think I was just looking at the participants list. And I don't know about you, but I'll get to the journal in just a minute. But I was allowed to uh, wax a little bit about some reasons of COVID and what it has meant for me as a scholar of history of Christianity. Um, as I look at the 65 participants, I just there is a deep longing created just to see some of these folks. You know, it would have been really fantastic to have had the opportunity. Uh, like Dan, I was on leave a sabbatical last semester. I was supposed to be in the archives in London and Cambridge and Oxford, but all for naught. I was in, uh, huddled up in Nashville, Tennessee, and it's been uh, relatively okay. I haven't been to my office in 11 months, and I think it still ends. And, but I think just more than anything else, the ongoing work of the society has been a real encouragement. I think being able to connect with colleagues, both within the ASCH and beyond, has been really great. I think just to know that we're not alone in these endeavors, uh, scholarship can be defined as relatively solitary enterprise, but when you dig deeper, you know, it's always collective and communal and uh, collegial. So I think I, I am really beholden to this society. I remember uh, working with uh, a lot with Ron Ritgers and Ralph Keen and Candy Gunter Brown when I was uh, in Anthea's shoes and then to have the opportunity and privilege to work with Dan Ramirez and Anthea Butler has been a really, really great honor. So be just enough with the personal reflections. On to our journal then, let's turn uh, to our journal, Church, Church History Studies in Christianity and Culture, edited by a team led by Andrea Stark at the University of Minnesota in 2020, despite publishing delays due to the pandemic and staffing changes, Church History has published 24 articles, a book forum, and 224 book reviews and notes. We continue to get very strong numbers of submission to the journal, including this year article submissions from 23 countries, that's right, 23 countries representing every continent except for the Antarctica. So we can be excused for missing that one. And along with ongoing expansion of our digital teaching and research archive, the journal began two new initiatives this year. One in June, we published our first virtual special issue, Looking Forward, Looking Back, Christianity in Latin America and the Caribbean including seven previously published uh, church history articles on this theme. We plan to continue publishing at least one virtual thematic issue each year. And I think this is a great, great new uh, endeavor. Uh, secondly, this summer we began to post and advertise over social media lists of 10 to 15 books of the month in the history of Christianity, representing scholars in diverse periods and geographical regions. Again, this is a fantastic kind of new venture because we haven't had anything like that. And just kind of keeping, keeping the presence of ASH, ASCH in the consciousness of many of our members and would-be members, especially graduate students who are always looking for the kind of books that I should be uh, reading to stay kind of, you know, a cutting edge in Okrant. So uh, these lists have been very well received so far, as far as I know. And we plan to continue featuring new books of interest to our members on these lists each month. So you'll be receiving some of those if not already. And I think this really augurs well for our future kind of interfacing with social media and so on. And uh, 
who better to talk about social media matters and other things than Anthea Butler herself. So on to you, Anthea. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you so much for being here tonight and joining us for a short business meeting and more importantly, a prize ceremony. It's always great to be with you in the society, whether we're in present or virtually as we are now. And we all know virtual is the way that we have to be this year. And so for someone like me who spends a lot of time in the virtual world, or at least as much time as I can when I'm not the chair of the department, um, <clears throat> It's an interesting time and it's an interesting time for us as a society, but part of this has a silver lining. It has a silver lining in terms of having to have the society think about technology and the new ways that we can use it and become closer to all of our members. And so while this started off a little rocky, I think that we're all well on our way to doing something that I think will be of benefit to everyone in the society. So first of all, thank you for being here. For all of you who were hoping to be in Seattle and had sent in a, a proposal and didn't get there, um, my apologies to you. We had to truncate this program and we had to do some soul searching about what we needed to do, how long we needed to do it, and to also keep you in mind. And we know that some of you are teaching, some of you like me are spending long hours on Zoom and um, I have new nice glasses so that I can be able to spend new nice long hours on Zoom. And so we want to make sure that this was A, viable for you, and B, digestible in a way that you would be able to enjoy it. So hence this shorter truncated meeting. But I want to assure you, first of all, that we're going to be doing some programming that I think will help us for 2021. So let me talk about that and tell you a little bit about what I see for the rest of the year. And then I'll speak briefly about what we think our meeting will be like in 2022, or at least what we hope might happen. Um, since we've shifted to this digital conferencing format, what we're planning are several events throughout the year in which you can participate. In March and April, we're going to have two special sessions on contemporary issues of, in America on sexuality and race. And then in the fall, we're going to be asking for a small um, group of people to come on and do three panels on global pre-modern Christianity. Because one of the things we noted, and I noted as I read through all of your proposals this year for this conference, is that I would have liked to have had more things that were um, you know, basically 1500 backwards and we didn't. And so I wanna be able to focus on that from a global scale. At the end of the day, some of you don't know this, but I'm a trained as a 2000 year Christian historian and I have a special interest in global Christianity. And so I wanna complement that with doing this through September through November of next year. So there'll be one panel a month on that and we'll be giving you more information on that soon. We have met once to discuss our strategy for scheduling an in-person meeting for ASCH 2022. As you might guess, this is really dicey right now for a variety of reasons. It seems as though the AHA is going to go ahead with a scheduled in-person meeting for January, 2022 in New Orleans. And I know you all wanna to go to New Orleans. I definitely wanna to go to New Orleans. However, we are going to make an announcement by the end of this month with a final decision about the timing and form of our 2022 conference. It is our strong desire to meet in person if we possibly can. I think you would wanna see your friends. It's hard not seeing the people that we admire as scholars and friends. And New Orleans seems like a really great place to do that. But there are a lot of variables that we have to consider and we need to put that before the council before we can make a decision. And then finally, what I wanna say is that we're also going to be at some point probably here in the next, I would say 60 to 90 days, making some decisions about a call for papers as well. So please be on the lookout for that. And hopefully by then we'll be able to tell you everything that's gonna happen for next year and 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Anthea. And now we'll hear from a few words from our secretary, um, Caleb Maskell. Uh, good evening, everybody. Nice to see you virtually. I see some of you in list form, some of you on camera. We're all, we all know the drill at this point, but it's nice to be reminded of everyone and look forward to being with you all in person uh, one of these days, not too long from now. I don't have much to say, uh, except that I want to introduce Jesse Sponholtz. Jesse was the chair of the Research and Prizes Committee this year. Uh, that's a very interesting committee to be on. For those of you who've been on it, you will know that. On the one hand, it's quite a lot of work because you have to read an awful lot of books. 
On the other hand, it's quite rewarding because the, a lot of the books that you read are really wonderful. And uh, we have with us tonight people who have won uh, the three major book prizes that we award every year. And Jesse is going uh, to speak uh, about their work. Uh, you can see their faces. I don't know that they are going to say anything besides thank you. So you might want to take a quick look just at who they are. We wanted you to be able to actually uh, put a face with a name and uh, congratulate these folks, uh, you know, in whatever way is possible over Zoom. And then after Jesse speaks, Andrea Sturk will uh, introduce uh, our Mead Prize winner uh, for this year as well. So Jesse, why don't I uh, turn it over to you now? Great, thanks, Caleb. Um, uh, I, I really um, enjoyed being able to work on the um, research and prize committee this year, and um, I really want to thank all the members that we have. A very large committee, as Caleb said, there's a lot of entrants to these very competitive uh, book prizes. So it's a very large committee with a diverse range of expertise, and it's been really a joy to work with them. And I want to thank them, including those who are who are watching, for their dedication, for their professionalism in in reviewing these books, and for their graciousness as we as we worked as hard as we could to get the books to their to wherever they were um, during the during the pandemic, it took a little extra effort this year, and I appreciate their um, their 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 graciousness as we worked as we worked together. And I especially want to thank Beth Kreitzer, the previous chair of this committee, for giving me advice along the way um, about uh, about solving this big problem about identifying the top the top books. I'm going to begin by announcing the prize for the, um, the Frank S. and Elizabeth D. Brewer Prize. This is the prize for that awards outstanding scholarship um, in history of Christianity for a first time book author. Uh, the winner of the prize this year is um, Kate, uh, Katie, Ann, Katie Ann Marie Bugish for her book, The Care of Nuns, The Ministry of the Benedictine Women in England During the Central Middle Ages. The Care of Nuns adds complexity to the history of female religious life in England through the meticulous examination of manuscripts owned and often written by members of English Benedictine convents, as well as by drawing on saints' lives and other writings. Bugish demonstrates that from the 10th to the 13th century, Benedictine nuns performed a host of ministries, including active participation in liturgy, hearing confessions, and offering intercessionary prayers. The extraordinary scope of Lucas's book thus illuminates the many pastoral roles of religious women during a period for which scholarship um, still uh, usually privileges male-centered pastoral activity. Framing chapters around supposedly normative patterns of leadership as reflected in monastic rules and customaries, Bugish examined sources such as the manuscripts used and produced in these houses in concert with the vitae of abbesses and other materials to expand and deepen our knowledge of women's ministry uh, to each other and to those outside their communities. By highlighting women's agency in many avenues of religious life, the care of nuns thus opens new insights into the diverse contributions of women's religious houses in the central Middle Ages. Lucas's care, The Care of Nuns is a model of sophistication in its interpretation and its explanation, explication of sources, as well as a testament to the enormous amount of archival work completed by its author. It encourages readers to broaden and enrich their understanding of pastoral work in the history of the Christian tradition. Congratulations, Dr. Bugis. And I, I have this um, I have this trophy. I can't give you the, the certificate and the check itself, but I have this trophy to symbolically hand to you uh, in, in, in the in congratulations. Jesse, thank you very much for that generous laudatio. I'm very honored and just grateful for the, the hard work of the committee and also for the hard work of the leadership of the American Society of Church History. Thank you. Our, our next uh, prize is the Albert C. Outler Prize. The Outler Prize honors the best book published um, in the previous year that illuminates the, his, the diverse history of global Christianity, including issues of Christian unity and disunity and interactions between Christianity and other faiths. This year's Outler Prize goes to Erin Rowe for her book, Black Saints in Early Modern Global Catholicism. Rowe's Black Saints, brings together two historical narratives that have long been the focus of scholarly attention, the, scholar, the transatlantic slave trade and global Catholic missions. She puts them together to shed light on a largely unstudied development, the emergence of black saints who were worshiped with surprising frequency in the Americas, Iberia, and even Africa during the early modern period. 
people of the African diaspora formed associations to venerate not only black sacred finger, figures from ancient Ethiopia, but more recent figures like Benedict de Palermo and Antonio de Noto. Black Christians during the early modern era used metaphors of spiritual slavery to give divine meaning to and hope for redemption from the brutalities of enslavement. Rowe also examines the hostility that emerged among some white Catholics and to this veneration, including efforts to silence or suppress black confraternities. Researching this subject meant tireless explorations in archives and libraries on three continents. It also included detailed study of early modern sculptures and other artwork depicting black saints in Catholic churches, chapels, museums, convents, and elsewhere. Rowe has recaptured a lost history of global Catholicism that deserves attention as scholars continue to uncover the legacies both of mass enslavement and of global missionizing campaigns uh, for the world today. Congratulations, Dr. Rowe. And here's it. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much um, for the, the, those generous words and to thank you so much to the committee for, for their hard work. Our our last uh, book prize uh, for this year is the Philip Schaff Prize, um, which honors annually the best book in the history of Christianity by a North American scholar uh, published in the previous year. This year, Schaff Prize goes to David D. Hall for his book, The Puritans, Transatlantic History. Hall's book is a sweeping in scope, meticulously researched and brilliantly written. It covers familiar topics such as the English and Scottish Reformations, the international reformed movement, Puritanism in New England, Scottish Covenanters, and the wars of 17th, 17th century England and Scotland, as well as the re re realignments of the late 17th century. However, by looking at interactions between these topics and placing them in broader European and Atlantic perspectives, Hall opens up new vistas for readers. He emphasized Puritans' ideological links to the reformed international without limiting himself to Geneva and Zurich, highlighting connections to the continent that had been previously overlooked or underrated. Hall's transnational perspective also allows readers to contextualize questions such as episcopy and royal supremacy in post-Reformation England outside the narrow parameters of English exceptionalism and to appreciate the internal contradictions and disunity within the Puritan movement, as well as the way in which practical divinity gave Puritanism power in the public realm beyond any elusive doctrinal uniformity. Hall's transatlantic perspective thus allows readers to appreciate both the connections and the ruptures that 19th century memory culture of Puritans, both in, in Europe and in, and in North America, helped to obscure. The Puritans, a transatlantic history, marks pinnacle of scholarship by one of the leading historians of Puritanism in the world and will prove influential for historical discussions on both sides of the Atlantic for many years to come. Congratulations, Dr. Hall. Am I muted? Can you, you hear me? Not any longer. I want to just say that um, that's an exceptionally illuminating to me as well as to others a way of looking at the book. Uh, I, I, learned, I learned from it myself uh, about the book. So I, I'm deeply grateful to the committee. Uh, I loved writing this book. It was a lot of hard work, but um, again, I'm just very, very grateful to the committee for being honored in this, in this manner. Thank you. Well, well-deserved. And, and I can speak for the whole committee to, to say that not only was your book a, a joy to read, but uh, uh, Aaron Rowe and, and Kitty Bugius, all, all of these books were really quite, quite remarkable and a joy to read. And I, um, I congratulate uh, all the winners. All right. Well, it seems like we need a master's of seminaries here. So I'm just going to step in. <laughs> because um, do we have anything else to do, El Presidente? We, have, uh, Andrea. we do, yeah. an Andrea Stern. Andrea. Okay, Andrea. You're good. Okay. Sorry, I Sorry. Wasn't, <laughs> wasn't sure if I was supposed to jump in or. Um, 
Yes, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the um, winner of this year's Sydney E. Mead Prize. Um, the Mead Prize is granted to an advanced graduate student or recent PhD for the best unpublished article stemming from dissertation research that contributes significantly to the field and to the history of Christianity more broadly. And the editors considered nine nominations this year and agreed unanimously to award the Mead Prize to Dr. Christopher Bonura. Um, Dr. Bonura is, received his PhD in history from UC Berkeley in August 2019, and he's currently a lecturer in, in history at Berkeley. Chris specializes in the religious history of the Mediterranean in late antiquity and the Middle Ages with a, a particular focus on Byzantium. He wrote his dissertation on the reception of the four kingdoms of Daniel in late antiquity, the early medieval Middle East and Byzantium, and he is currently working on a book on the apocalypse of Pseudo-Methodius. Chris's article, which will be published in Church History later this year, is tentatively entitled Eusebius of Caesarea on the Roman Empire and the Four Kingdoms of Daniel, reevaluating the origins of Byzantine imperial eschatology. Emphasizing the importance of this topic for all historians of Christianity, one reviewer explained, controversy has always attached to whether or to what degree Eusebius gave a divine sanction to the Roman Empire and a fortiori to the whole subsequent history of Christian involvement with the state. As all students of Eusebius are aware, he becomes a kind of Rorschach test for how one sees religion, politics, and the state. And both reviewers of this manuscript emphasize the importance of the topic, a clearly presented and thoroughly researched argument, the impressive survey of the primary sources, giving attention to Eusebius's writings that are less known and much less considered. And as a result, they both concluded that Bonura is poised to make a distinctive contribution to this debate. Or as one reviewer summarized, this submission should absolutely be published. And so it will. So Chris, congratulations. I don't have a trophy, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, thank you. This is an immense honor and thank you to the committee and thank you to Andrea and all the people who work on the journal Church History. One of the sort of small joys during this pandemic period is to have it show up in, in my mailbox and I'm sure other people have this experience too and just feel connected to scholarship and to other scholars. So I, I really appreciate all that all of you do. Wonderful, wonderful. We'll be closing now with uh, just a few more thoughts here. As you can see for the program, there will be no presidential address this year. So I would like to turn from the question of scholarship to reflect on a more personal, on the more personal dimensions of the current societal juncture. First, I wish to acknowledge the painful losses endured by several of our members. We have lost loved ones for whom our success and thriving meant everything. We have lost colleagues and the ability to gather to robustly celebrate their legacy. Many families, especially those at the vulnerable edges of our society, have not enjoyed the luxury of safe retreat to workspaces at home, but have continued to report to quote, essential work and have been infected, have been hospitalized and have died at significantly, significantly higher rates. I do not need to rehearse the sobering statistics for you. As someone in touch with the Latina church, I am sensing my own funeral fatigue and a general anxiety over the loss of memory and stories, anchoring stories. I am sure that many prematurely absent members of my generation were looking forward to conversations in their sunset years with curious grandchildren. Those plans like the expectations of the field mouse have now been vaporized. Many families and congregations and communities are newly bereft of economic anchors, leaders, and memory. This is where historical consciousness has helped. 
I and others are proposing to establish a foundation for Latino Pentecostal history, independently of the denominations, to rescue memory, to systematize Facebook and YouTube nostalgia, and to prepare the next generation of historians, and to supply the raw material for a new creative generation to take the story to the stage, screen, and creative page. The journalistic and historical work on American churches' responses to the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic has helped to tamp down some extreme resistance to sober public health measures. Some, several colleagues have contributed to this work. But one particular story has helped my family keep things in context. It involves our paternal grandmother, Maria Mendoza. Nana Maria was born after the turn of the 20th century in a small village Rancho Magallanes, near the small town of Benjamo, Guanajuato in central Mexico. Her late childhood was made precarious by the raging Mexican Revolution that left one out of every 10 Mexicans dead and another one out of every 10 uprooted. They never returned home. And just as the revolutionary regime was consolidating under a new constitutional order in 1917 and 18, influenza flooded in from the United States, beginning at the Texas border and several ports and threshing its way through to Mexico City. This made Maria's adolescence and youth even more precarious. She was the sole survivor in her immediate family. In fact, Guanajuato seems to have been one of the epicenters with its capital city having a death rate 200 per day, twice that of Mexico City. Unfortunately, there has been scant research on the effects of the pandemic outside of Mexico City's urban area. My late uncle Eliseo told me in a 1999 interview that the village, village elders told him during a 1970s visit that if one dug anywhere in the valley, one would uncover human bones just inches beneath the soil. So great was the extent of the epidemic. Those bones would include my great-grandparents, of course. In the moment, Maria had little time for mourning. There were additional survivors, namely three younger cousins, orphaned, whom she took in and saw through to their early youth. Then came love and a child, my uncle Eliseo, or Eusebio Castaneda, according to his baptismal certificate. Unfortunately, the father was already married, so Maria took refuge with an older cousin, Pancho Pistolas, so nicknamed because of a photo of him in the Mexican Revolution. Soon thereafter, Pancho left for the States and settled in Del Mar, north of San Diego. There he met a countryman, Hilario Ramirez from Irapuato, also in Guanajuato State. After two decades of residency in the States, Hilario was seeking to settle down. Pancho shared his cousin's plight and availability. Soon, a letter arrived to the village. Hilario offered marriage to Maria, a home for her son, and included money for the train fare from Silao, Guanajuato to Ciudad Juarez, El Paso. They met on the international bridge, connecting the sister border cities, secured civil marriage in Ciudad Juarez, and crossed over. Little Eusebio Castaneda exited Mexico under that birth name and entered the U.S. as Eliseo Ramirez. Hilario Ramirez presented him as his son. There was nothing legal about that on-the-spot adoption, by the way. I like to say that Theo Eliseo was the original dreamer in 1924. Don't worry. Any concern over the legal ambiguity was assuaged by his later military service and near death in New Guinea and the Philippines during World War II. His younger brothers also answered Theo Sam's call in World War II and Korea. He was buried with full honors in San Diego's military Miramar Cemetery. And later generations have continued the uncle's legacy of military service. 10 years after her arrival, Maria converted a paradigm shift and became a founding member of the Apostolic Church of Solana Beach. Two of her sons, Eliseo and my father Louis, were exemplary lay leaders in their congregations and denominations. Two others, Robert and Tomas, served as bishops 
on the governing board of the denomination. My fathers and uncles in turn commissioned me to go to Yale and to, in their words, bring back those skills, the gold of the Egyptians in Pentecostal parlance for our people. By then, Maria had long finished her race. I bask in the comforting and empowering thought, though, that although our lives overlapped by a mere two years, she surely nestled me in her arms, drew me close to her breast, and dispatched a matriarchal blessing. I briefly visited Rancho Magallanes during a summer of post Yale study in Mexico City. The aged elders of the village were those very children that Nana Maria had rescued. I was given a princely welcome as the grandson of their sainted Dia Maria, and their stories confirmed family lore. I look forward to returning to Rancho Magallanes when circumstances allow. I want to see what stories those long buried bones can tell Maria's progeny now at this troubled juncture. One conclusion is already apparent to me. As with many migrant stories, Maria's desperate circumstances, including the ravages of the revolution and the calamity of pandemic, opened her mind up to entertaining the proposal from a distant man she did not know. Put simply, there was little left to tie her down as she joined the flow of uprooted humanity. I marvel at her chutzpah, boarding a train with her infant child and enough food for the trip to the mysterious Norte. And I marvel at the outcome, a flourishing clan that provided key leadership in the Latino Pentecostal community of the 20th century. I have similar hopes for the American Society of Church History and our guilt. We are not sure what the new normal may look like. We may undergo some paradigm shifts, but when the students of our students gather down the road, may they marvel at our chutzpah and nimble doggedness and at the outcome. Have a great conference, everybody. 